Hello, and thank you for spending some time with Ohio State University President Christina Johnson and West Virginia President Gordon Gee as they engage in a fireside chat about the 21st century land-grant mission. This fireside chat was created in celebration of Ohio State's sesquicentennial anniversary, a celebration of all Buckeyes are, all we've accomplished, and all that is yet to come. This fireside chat is focused in part on material from the book Fulfilling the 21st Century Land-Grant Mission, essays in honor of The Ohio State University's sesquicentennial celebration, published in 2020 by The Ohio State University Press. Because you are viewing this fireside chat, you may purchase this book for 30% off the list price and receive free shipping if you use the special code LAND GRANT when you order. My name is Steve Gavazzi, and I am one of your co-hosts for this fireside chat. I am joined today by David Staley. Let me first tell you a little bit about myself. I am a professor of human sciences in the College of Education and Human Ecology. This is my 30th year at Ohio State, and I have held several senior administrative positions during my tenure, including having served as the Dean and Director of the Ohio State Mansfield campus. And now let me share a little bit of information about my co-host. David Staley is an associate professor in the history department here at Ohio State. He also serves as the director of our university's Humanities Institute. Because the Fulfilling the 21st Century Land Grant Mission book plays such a prominent role in our fireside chat today, let me tell you a little bit about the book itself. The book is a collection of 34 essays written by 40 authors who either currently work at Ohio State or have held prominent positions at the university in the past. This includes former OSU presidents Michael Drake, Gordon Gee, and Britt Kerwin, as well as former OSU provosts Ed Ray and Joe Steinmetz, who both left to become the senior leaders at other land-grant universities. Ed Ray recently retired from his position as president of Oregon State University, and Joe Steinmetz is currently serving as the chancellor of the University of Arkansas. Another notable author is Clark Kellogg, a former basketball standout at Ohio State, as well as having served as a board of trustees member. This book was designed to cover a significant number of topic areas that make Ohio State the great land-grant university that it is. The three-part mission of the university, teaching, research, and service to communities through our outreach and engagement activities, is prominently featured throughout the book. The authors were asked to focus on three main objectives as they wrote their essays. They were asked to keep in mind the difference between an A and an A+, which is another way of describing the difference between being great and being truly exceptional. They also were asked to keep the land-grant mission, teaching, research, and service to communities as the focal point of their writing. Finally, they were asked to discuss not only what makes Ohio State so amazing right now as a land-grant university, but also to think about what the future will hold for one of America's premier institutions of higher learning. We wanted this book to create a sense of being land-grant fierce, which means that we are passionately proud of our mission. And as you will discover today, there are no more land-grant fierce presidents than Christina Johnson and Gordon Gee. Christina Johnson is Ohio State's 16th president. President Johnson brings to Ohio State more than 30 years of experience and leadership in the academic, business, and public policy sectors. Having three degrees in electrical engineering from Stanford University, she also was a varsity athlete in field hockey and founded the club varsity lacrosse team. Dr. Johnson has close family ties to Ohio State and Ohio. 
Her grandfather graduated from Ohio State in 1896, having played right guard on one of the early football teams. Also, family lore has it that Dr. Johnson's grandfather met her grandmother on the Columbus campus. Gordon Gee is one of America's most prominent higher education leaders, having helmed universities for more than three decades. In 2009, Time magazine named him one of the top 10 university presidents in the United States. Dr. Gee currently is serving as the 24th president of West Virginia, and he got his start as a senior leader when he was named WVU's 19th president. Dr. Gee also served as the 11th and 14th president of the Ohio State University. Hi, how are you, Steve? Good, how are, how are your day going? Good, good to see you all. Hello everyone, how are you? Hey, how are you? Uh, President Johnson, out of all of the opportunities you have had to lead an institution, you selected a land grant university. What were the most important reasons you had for making this choice? And what have you learned about land grant institutions since the time of your arrival? Well, thank you very much, Steve. Uh, first of all, The Ohio State University is just an iconic storied institution. And both of us have had the honor to serve, obviously, uh, President Gee a little longer than myself. But you start there and then you, you think about it being the second largest land grant institution in the country. and that comes with an incredible opportunity to serve and to serve those in the communities in which we live. So here's just a statistic that I think is interesting. The Ohio State University serves more low income students than the entire Ivy League, all eight universities combined. So I think when you have the opportunity to make that kind of impact and difference, um, you know, I just feel so honored to be able to have been selected to do that and to follow in the footsteps of my mentor, uh, Gordon Gee. Well, speaking of Gordon Gee, President Gee, you, on the other hand, have been the leader of two major land grant universities for a significant portion of your career, twice as the president of The Ohio State University, and now you've taken the helm at West Virginia University for the second time. Yet, you also have been the president of other public and private institutions of higher learning that are not land grants. What are some of the major differences between land grants and non-land grants that you've experienced as a leader? Well, uh, first of all, I, I just want to be on the record here that uh, Ohio State has a wonderful new president. Uh, she and I have known each other and been great friends for, what is it, Christina, 30 years now. And at least. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, at least, at least uh, uh, when I came to the University of Colorado and, uh, and what a joy it is for me to see her uh, take on this great uh, opportunity. And it is a great opportunity. Uh, I, the, way that I, the way I describe it is, uh, and Christine has been at a couple of great private institutions, Duke and, and obviously Johns Hopkins and I, I, I at Brown and at Vanderbilt. And, and the way I describe it is the fact that when I was at those institutions, um, I felt really privileged. I would wake up in the morning and, and, and think what a wonderful opportunity I had. Uh, when I wake up as the president, or when I'd wake up as the president of Ohio State, or uh, now of West Virginia, I know why I'm there. Uh, the land grant universities are this country's mission, and they have a great purpose. Uh, and that purpose is to serve. You know, Abraham Lincoln made it very, very clear that uh, that at that time uh, it was not simply, in fact, uh, when uh, Justin Morrell came to him. I wasn't there, although some people think I was. I I attended his inauguration. I attended Lincoln's inauguration. But anyway, anyway, what they what they what they what he said to him. He said, "Mr. President, this is not simply about." Uh, 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 about race, it's about access to the American dream. And so we need to create a people's university and that's what the land grant universities are. Uh, and, and I believe this, and, 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 I, and I'm certain that Christina will share this with you also, that, that there's no more important time than right now with this fast forward tumultuous world in which we find ourselves for the solidity of a land grant university um, tethering people uh, to the exceptional opportunities we have. Excellent. Do you agree, Christina? Oh, absolutely, of course. 
<laughs> no, absolutely. It's um, it's what you all wrote in your book about two two aspects being the servant university, and then also having the responsibility to have that harmonious relationship between the campus and the community. So appreciate those words. Yeah. Don't, don't you think, uh, I mean, I was just thinking about it uh, because you had such a great career at Duke and, and at Johns Hopkins, but, uh, you know, I always describe it as, as, as the privilege of those places, yeah. but, but I'm certain you're already feeling it. You know, the people of Ohio love Ohio State. I mean, if you travel that state, those big, those big uh, uh, block goes everywhere. Um, <laughs> Uh, and, and, you know, uh, I always joke about the fact that I was never able to get uh, uh, 110,000 people to see a chemistry lecture, but they sure love to come and, and be part of the institution in so many different ways. And I, there is a special feel about that public university, isn't there? We, we felt it some, somewhat at Colorado, but, you know, there is always Colorado State, which was, was yeah. the land grant institution. Right. No, I, for sure. I mean, I was out voting just last week and in line and everybody had on some kind of Buckeye sweatshirt or a ball cap. I had students in front of me and you know, the, the time went very quickly because we all had something to talk about and, and, and to cheer for. Yeah, well, it is a special place and, and these land grant universities are very special. President Gee, you and Steve uh, wrote a book on land grant universities in 2018, Land Grant Universities for the Future, terrific book. And uh, you use the term land grant fierce to describe the attitude that land grant university leaders should adopt. What did you mean by land grant fierce? And I wonder how that attitude has changed as a result of our current COVID-19 moment. Yeah, we love our book, by the way, just, just to point it out. But anyway, anyway, I, oh, there you go. There you go. I tell you, we're hawking things today right now. Well, you know, so, so one of the things that I think Steve and I found, and certainly I found it out over time, is the fact that, um, is the fact that uh, land grant universities in so many ways have floated away from their moorings. Uh, they've tried to become more and more like other institutions. Um, I think a lot of it driven by, 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 by credible aspirations, but nonetheless, not necessarily uh, sticking to their knitting. The second thing, of course, and I, I love to do this, is uh, the worst thing to happen to higher education is U.S. News and World Report. What they've done is they've amalgamated and, uh, and terrorized university presidents. Uh, and so people are, people are really, uh, people are really uh, trying to uh, formulate their institutions based on U.S. News uh, ranking. And by the way, I will point out there's, there's never been a, a, a public university ranked in the top 20. What does that tell you? It, it, it just simply says that, uh, that, that it's, a, it's a false positive. Saying that, um, the, the universities of the future are going to be those that differentiate themselves, are going to be different, and that they, that, that they really fly to the sun, whichever that sun is for them. And I do believe that that is the great, that's the fierce opportunity of the Lion Grant University. We have a college. We don't need to invent our calling. We just need to live according to the dictates of our calling. And I think that that's what makes it so special. What has COVID-19 uh, done to that fierceness, I suppose? Well, I, I think actually it's helped us understand a little bit more because I, uh, Ohio State has a great academic medical center. They have sociologists and, uh, and, and people in political science, a variety of other things who are trying to deal to trying to understand what this means for the people of Ohio. There are 11.6 million Ohioans. There's 1.8 million West Virginians. And every day I think that what we're trying to do is solve their problems. Right. That's you know, nice. you know, uh, you, you, you know, if we can come up with rapid tests, if we can come up with a vaccine at the Wexford Medical Center, it's not about taking it to Washington and bragging. It's about taking it to uh, Athens County in mm -hmm. Ohio and inoculating people. That's the difference. That's the difference. And a dovetail on that. So right now in COVID, we are carrying out a couple of vaccine trials. We're part of a couple of vaccine trials, I should say, at the Wexner Medical Center. And, you know, and as um, uh, President Key mentioned, that we have the College of Public Health, which has really been a leader in COVID. So we've developed over the last couple of months uh, a way to test 60,000 individuals a week. 
we're actually, we've done already 150,000 tests at the Ohio State University. And here's what we've learned. We've learned a few things and we're, we're working with the governor's office in order to take those learnings to scale across the entire state. First thing we've learned is we don't see any in-classroom transmission from our instructors or our graduate students and the students in the classroom. That tells you something about the kind of uh, protocols that we've installed in those classrooms that are keeping our students, faculty, and staff safe. And it shows that masking and social distancing work. So one of the things we did is that we looked at models and we said our class sizes were too high. We need to take them from 100 down to 50. We're not testing enough. We need to increase that by an order of magnitude. And to get some leverage, we were able to work with our medical centers and our medical colleges and work out a pool testing. So we can take five to 10 people, put all their, their bodily fluids in a particular uh, beaker and just do one test. And at low positivity rates, that's a very accurate way at low cost to get rid of all the people that don't have it. So you just really find the needles in the haystack that have it. All those things are done to not only keep our students, faculty and staff safe on campus and in the surrounding communities, but to contribute that knowledge to the state of Ohio. So. You know, I think we've been very active and very actively engaged with the governor, with our local uh, public health, as I know uh, Dr. Gee has been as well in, in West Virginia. Yeah, I think that um, I think that what we're learning is that um, we're, we're treating our universities in some ways like a petri dish, yeah. and uh, and and what we're learning here is we can we can extrapolate it to the communities in so many different ways. Um, and, and I say about the communities because our problem here is the fact that we have a university of about 33,000 students and a, and, a, and a college town of about 30,000. So <laughs> if our students get sick, the whole, uh, uh, the whole community does. You're fortunate to be in a city of two, two and a half million, uh, even though the university is, is so big, it doesn't quite affect it that way, but you have to be concerned about those communities and the very fact that we've been able to control inside the classroom. You know, every morning, I don't know what you do, Christina, but I, I wake up every morning, I take a look at how many students, how many people do we have in, in, in our hospital? How many, how many of them are on COVID watch? Uh, and, 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 um, and how is our testing going? And all of those things together give us a lot more confidence. Um, the other thing I'll say just for all of you, I think that our university, both of us did something very interesting. The kids came back, they wanted to have fun. They had too much fun, they spiked. Yeah. And, and, we both, and we both quieted that down. But the students now are much more serious because yes, they, they, are. Don't, they don't want to go home and, and be back in their mother's basement. So there's really a learning experience that's going on here. Yeah, no, that's that's exactly right. We we both have worked really dil diligently to take our positivity rates and our transmission rates down to where now, you know, in fact, I look at it uh, a couple times a day. We have a little dashboard and yeah, I just I looked at it before we got on here, actually. So we're down to 0.6% positivity rate um, for our on-campus and 0.8% for all our students. When you look at the false positive rate of error and false negative, I mean, you know, you look at that and you'd say, we're driving it to nearly, you know, nearly zero. And that's where we want to be. We want to have a clean campus. Tomorrow we'll play football with a clean playing field. And that's also been a way that we've contributed. Dr. Borchers, who co-chaired the medical committee that worked out the protocol for having a clean playing field so that Big Ten could get back, back, uh, back to football. So those are, you know, in other ways that we contribute to the well-being, you know, mental and physical well-being of our communities. You can have any, uh, I, I don't think you're going to have uh, people in the stands, is that right? We are, we're not going to have uh, fans in the stands. We will have families of players. And in order to, to get in, you need to be tested. So, um, yeah, that, well, that's exactly what we did um, uh, with fans and with, with, with families in the stands. But we did have about, uh, we did have about uh, uh, 15 or 20% of our stadium oh. last time. We had them all distance out. And you know, what was wonderful is that our fans lived by that. That's uh, great. Yes, I, you I know, pictures. I, were, yeah, it was really phen phenomenal. You know, I think, I, think, I think we who live in these big glass houses, we don't realize that people actually do want to do the right thing. And it was, it was so, it was so uh, interesting to me to actually sit there and watch it. Of course, I've watched 
more football in my pajamas than I ever have in my life, but it was great to actually be in the stadium for once. That's cool. That's awesome. Yeah, it is. Uh, President Johnson, you stepped into the Ohio State presidency with COVID-19 in full swing, but there was also a great deal of social unrest, protests over the summer. What role can and should land-grant universities play in dealing with these twin issues? Right. So I think in, in part, um, you know, as we've said, we serve, we are the servant university, so we can also be a great convener of the kind, kind of conversations and the tough conversations, the uncomfortable conversations that have to take place if we're going to become an anti-racist society. And so that uh, we set up a task force on racism and uh, race, uh, racial inequities, set up a task force on safety and well-being. And we're having those conversations. We're coming up with action plans by which we can take a definitive action. One of the things was our 21 day uh, challenge, which is to commit to doing one thing every day to fight racism. Uh, the second is that we recognize that we have an obligation in my view and to reflect the demographics and our faculty, students and staff of the communities we live in and that we serve. And we're not there yet at the Ohio State University. So we'll be working on a major initiative around that as well. So yes, we have an obligation uh, to serve uh, our communities, and I'm pretty excited about that as well. So President Johnson, in the book, Fulfilling the 21st Century Land Grant Mission that David Staley and I co-edited uh, this year, our editors paid a great deal of attention to defining what the modern land grant university might look like. You mm -hmm. are an engineer by training. So using engineering as the example, how do you envision the appropriate 21st century balance that must be struck between the demand for excellence in teaching, excellence in research, and excellence in service to the communities of our state, our nation, and even the world? No, thanks very much for that question, Steve. Uh, I might have an interesting perspective as an engineer. So what do engineers do? We solve problems that are important to society. And interestingly enough, I think it's the same mission in the 21st century as it was uh, in the 20th century and the 19th century, which is when my grandfather graduated from the Ohio State University, which of course was found as agricultural and mechanical um, college. And he graduated in mechanical engineering. As an aside, he also played right guard in the football team at the time. Uh, but it's that uh, we do solve problems that are important to society. And one of the problems that is important to society is a trend that is sneaking up on us uh, like a tsunami over the last decade there have been 11.9 million new net jobs created since the Great Recession. And this is as of 2019. 11.8 million went to individuals with some kind of post uh, high school education, some college, whether it's certificate and associates and bachelor's and advanced degree. That's 99%. And furthermore, over that same decade, we had 3 million individuals lose their jobs that could be held by someone with only a high school degree. So now we're getting to a point where higher education is not a nice to, it's an essential. And it's essential to be able to take the analytical tools and quantitative approaches and apply them to all disciplines, uh, not just the, the rural community, but also the urban community. You know, one of my mentors is also a great fan of Dr. Gies, John Chambers is former CEO of uh, Cisco says that the jobs will go to the best educated workforce. So I look at the state of Ohio and only 16% of the citizens of the eligible age have a bachelor's degree and only 11% have a post bachelor's degree. So if we are going to thrive and survive in this ever more technological world, we need to make sure that we're serving the individuals in which the communities that we reside, reside. that's the first thing. I think the second thing so we want to particularly be mindful about, and it goes back to the last question that, that you talked about, which is um, becoming an anti-racist society. So you look at the wealth disparity based on racial lines in the city of Columbus, in which our university is associated, and we're ranked for the size of community, number three in the country for racial disparities along the lines of wealth. So that's unacceptable and it's because the, the number of managers in the city uh, that are African-American is 3%, population is more like 14%. Same with those who have a computer science, engineering, math background, it's 1%. So 
So we have an obligation. And in fact, this is something that my grandfather did when he first went to work for Westinghouse after graduating from Ohio State. He set up something called the casino schools. And I was going through his papers recently. If you come visit my office, you'll see some of the letters from those early 1900 days. And there's one letter that's, that's thanking him for setting up the casino technical school because he recognized that African-Americans and women within Westinghouse did not have the opportunities to have technical jobs. They were uh, janitors and uh, secretaries. So this is just something that's it's in our blood. It's in the blood of land grant. It's in the blood of engineers. And uh, I couldn't be more proud to be both of them right now. I'm curious, uh, just as a follow-up, was your grandfather also an engineer? Yes, he was. He graduated mechanical engineering. In fact, if you look carefully over my left shoulder, you'll see his diploma on the wall there. Um, and you can see it right there. You can see that the scarlet and gray ribbons on the diploma signed by the fourth president. Uh, I, see, I see my name on it. I can see my <laughs> name right there, as a matter of fact. <laughs> oh. oh, I yeah, you gotta you gotta have it. You know, I think that uh, I, I I think that um, the issue we have to face is this, and 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 Dr. Johnson said it so well, and that is the fact that there are 330 million Americans. There's 1.4 billion Chinese. There was 1.3 billion Indian. In, India will grow to about two billion by two. By, by 2050. So on the basis of mass, we lose. So the only thing that we have that really uh, enables us to remain competitive is, is our ability to outthink in order to outperform. And that's our business. We don't produce widgets. We don't produce, uh, we don't produce cars. We produce ideas and people who produce ideas and people who can wrestle with those ideas. And that, uh, you know, and, and Steve, by the way, uh, mm -hmm. Christina, Steve, and I have asked this question because we're, we're writing a, another book, which is this, that never in the history of this country have universities been more important. We are the economic engine for the future. And I think that, I think that the COVID, uh, the, the, the COVID, the pandemic has really accelerated that importance. But on the other hand, never before have American universities been under such siege. Uh, we're, we're now down below about 50% recognition. 40 years ago when I became a university president, that makes me tired. 40 years ago when I became a university president, 95% of the people in this country felt that universities and colleges were important. Now it's now below 50%. So how is it that our importance has gone up and our and the belief structure in what we're, what we're about have gone down? And I think that that is where the, the land grant university plays a particularly important role because it is the one institution that can that can collapse and and pull those uh, pull those pull uh, pull those views back together. I think. Yeah, interesting. Very true. Very true. Never more important. Yeah, absolutely not. President Key, I'm going to take yeah. us back to okay. this book, and, which, is, which uh, is a great book, and I have it. It is it is a terrific book, and you contributed uh, a, a, just a just a really terrific essay, "Adventures of Being a University President," which I really enjoyed reading. In that essay, I want to quote. Uh, this is a quote from the essay that you wrote. In the end, the issue for any president is to display courage, when courage in universities is in short supply. Probably the most profound sentence in the entire essay. So you wrote that essay before the pandemic, before the, uh, the, the recent calls for social justice. What were you thinking when you wrote that sentence? Uh, and uh, how, do you, how do you feel about that sentence in our current moment? Sure, I, I think, I, I think the, 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 the sort of the three C's are the, the universities face right now. One is complacency. That's one of the reasons that our that our uh, polls have gone down is the fact that we're very complacent about the roles we play and what we should be doing and telling our story and a variety of other things. I think that uh, I think the contagion is another thing where we we have we uh, we have uh, we have a lot of people uh, espousing a lot of ideas, but there's a contagion of not allowing those ideas to come forward. I I, I believe that I believe one of the greatest 
challenges that a university president faces right now is facing down people who say that the ideas are not welcome on our university campus. You know, we've got to, we, we simply have to cancel the cancel culture. Uh, it's just that easy because I, I really do believe that any university that says that people will not be invited, ideas are not welcome, is no longer a university, it's, it's a political catechism. And that is where the courage comes in, is you just have to stand up and say, look, uh, ideas are welcome here. We are an open institution. Yes, we're a safe place, but safe means that good ideas, bad ideas, interesting ideas, awful ideas, but the marketplace will prevail. And the minute that we start tinkering with the marketplace, and the minute that we start uh, saying, saying you can say this, but you can't say that, I believe that that is where the courage needs to come in right now. Do you have any reaction, uh, President Johnson? Well, I think definitely it's, uh, it does take courage. And I think we, we've seen that through COVID. I mean, for, and with the ideas, I totally agree with, with uh, President Key. And if you think about uh, COVID, I remember coming into work. Uh, I started officially September 1, but I came in, you know, full time the week ahead of time to kind of get a running start on things. It actually started just working on the, the COVID return to campus in August uh, after coming after driving to Columbus from New York State, the first thing I did was look at the return to campus plan, look at current data, modern, you know, what are the modern models say and say, okay, there's some things that we need to tweak here. So even though I started working the month of August, my official day was in September 1. I remember coming into the office on August 31st and really happy, Dr. Gee, that you have a bathroom in, out off your office. Yeah. Is it still there? <laughs> it's still there. And I was very happy because I, I remember calling Veronica and saying, you know, I kind of want to throw up <laughs> because I didn't want, because I was really concerned that it's what you don't know. Now, I felt that over the month of August, we had reduced our maximum class size. We require everyone to wear masks inside and outside. You know, we took up our testing by an order of magnitude and our tracing. And we put these little Buckeye pods, Gordon, you'd love to see these all over the, the oval, required social distancing, took, uh, stayed in line with the governor's uh, direction of no more than 10, 10 individuals at gatherings and events. And yet we were starting to see after students started moving in on August 13th, by the time we got to when classes started, we were spiking. And so it was really tough, but that's just when, uh, what you do as the university president, you find the experts on campus and say, okay, what are the, what are the data looking like today? What's our dashboard say? What, are we gonna make this call? No, we don't have to make this today. Let's see how tomorrow goes. And then we just worked our way through it. Now, you know, we're, we're home free. I will say there was a lot of over and under going on and what day we we're gonna make it to Labor Day. <laughs> so um, yeah, it's, it's a time all leaders through all, all colleges and universities in the country because we care about the kids, we care about the students, we care about the communities. And so here's the other question that was of great concern, which is if we test everyone, we're going to have more positive cases. I mean, you know, the more you test, the more you're gonna find. And the question is, would we overwhelm the hospitals? Now, fortunately we did have a Wexner Medical Center, but here are the da here's the data, 130,000 tests, 3,300 positive cases at least, two hospitalizations, just two. One was voluntary. The other one, the individual had underlying uh, comorbidities. Both got released within two days. Yeah. And we just didn't know that at the beginning. So you're kind of going into uncharted waters without a map, but just with science and data and great colleagues. And we have a wonderful team here. Yeah. I, I think we found the same thing. You know, we had uh, out of all of our tests and all of our positives, we had one person go to the hospital and the reason he went was that he was anxious about the fact that his test came back positive you know right. had to go over and pat him down you say you're all right but anyway uh uh but I, but i tell you what where the courage comes in right now and and uh because there are no right answers mm -hmm. when you're a university president right now in the middle of this pandemic there are no right answers the only answer that we have is the best answer that we can give with the information we had. I describe leading a university right now like having a thousand piece puzzle. 
you get up in the morning, there's the puzzle all over the, the all over the floor. You try or start trying to put it together and then you go to bed at night. And the <laughs> next day, then the next day you get up, there's another puzzle, uh, another thousand piece puzzle. Not the same puzzle. So you can't work on it like everyone else does, you know, for 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 a week or two. Everything is changing all the time. And so and 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 the other thing is is with social media, everyone knows how to run the university better than Christina does and better than I do. And they tell you about it. And and they also tell you how dumb you are all the time. So I think that that I, I think that that is the real challenge, uh, is being able to hold to hold to that uh, maxim that um, that that there are no right answers, but there are only best answers. And 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 that that, that requires a tremendous amount of courage because, as we know, uh, in today's world, you can get uh, you can really get uh, uh, on the wrong side of social media almost immediately. Well, uh, President Johnson, you mentioned maps and President Gee mentioned puzzles. And so this is the place in our talk today where we'd like to take the guardrails off for the both of you and just have you have a conversation. And to start that, just wondering now that you've heard all of these different uh, aspects of where we wanted to go today and you've heard President Gee's responses to them alongside your own, what do you most want to know from him now about Ohio State? I want to I want to know most from Dr. Gee just you know how you got to know so many people in such a short period of time and just really truly became beloved. I mean it's extraordinary and I, I know part of the secrets and I know that you're such a people's person and a relationship builder but you know so what are the you know just how you approached the position. I'm at the beginning of what I hope to be a very long tenure, and and uh, you've had that that pleasure of doing those things. So um, that would be what I'd be curious about: is just how you approach the job. And yeah, uh, I think that I, I think first of I, I think this about Ohio, and I think this about Ohio State. Um, and, and, and is is that if you love Ohioans, and you love the university, they'll love you back. And I think if they, if people feel, and this is particularly in the Middle West, uh, in the Midwest, if they, if they feel like you're, like you're passing through looking for next, they'll never appreciate you now. And, and I think that that's incredibly important. The other thing is that um, I think it's really, it's really very important to understand the culture. Um, you know, uh, each of these massive, big public universities in these Midwestern states have very unique cultures. The University of Michigan is as different as uh, from Ohio State as uh, as Venus is from Mars, and thank goodness, uh, thank goodness for that because I think that being a, being both a great research and a land grant university, where Michigan and Michigan State combined, uh, when you think about Ohio State. But I think that I, I think that issue of 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 really loving the institution and loving the people. Uh, that are there. I, when I when I first became university president, I'll end up with this one. When I first became university president in 1980, I went to visit Clark Kerr, the great founding founding uh, chancellor of the University of California system. And he said to me, he said to me in, in that visit, he said, well, he said, you know, never love a university because it won't love you back. And I thought about that. And, and I kind of treated it that way for a while. I thought, you know, this is you know, I'm kind of a, I'm kind of a cowboy. I'm riding here and then I'm riding there. And, and the truth of the matter is you can never really truly be an effective university president unless you love it to the point you'll cry uh, when things don't happen uh, the way you want to. And I, and I think that that's the secret for any kind of leadership role. No, I think that's very true. I think you do have to dig in. You have to love I've been uh, fortunate that every institution I've been able to serve, I've loved, just loved deeply. And I think fundamentally, um, you and I, Gordon, are, are, we're real people pe persons and people mean a lot to us. And so I, I do agree with you, that's that's a big secret. There are other things that are, that are necessary too. And I think you hit, hit on a big one, which is learning the culture. Yeah, I think I think that that's critical. And, and I think the other thing is that um, I think the other thing is that um, you have to have imagination about these institutions, you know. And I think that people, I think people really resonate to imagination. They really resonate to whatever. And you, and you have tremendous imagination. I know that from all the things you've done. 
and 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 the other thing is that this is people will invest in universities that believe in themselves. You know, I, I, I hate seeing university presidents. I go to these, I, I used to go to these AAU meetings and these guys would sit around and complain and whine. I'd say, well, why in hell sake are you in that job? You know, if it's so damn tough, then then get, get the heck out of it. Uh, you, you know, what you got to do is you've got to, you've got to inspire yourself and inspire the people around you. And, 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 and I think that that's an important component of being uh, a leader at this kind of an institution. President Gee, you just used the word imagination, and I'd like you to expand on that. When you when you say you know, that, that universities, university presidents need more imagination, what do you mean by that? Give us an example. Yeah, I'll tell you. I'll tell you one of the things that I find I, I find very few things distressing, but I'll tell you uh, both at Ohio State and West Virginia. The one thing I find distressing is when I ask them question, "Well, why are we doing that?" And they say, "Well, that's not the way we did things at Ohio State," as if you know. As if uh, you know, Mr. Buckeye came down or uh, whatever, and and gave us a notion, or the same thing if Jerry West came down in in West Virginia. So, um, and and so what I've discovered is that uh, is that is that our institutions are places in which curiosity should be our number one ingredient. We need to be curious about ideas. We need to be curious about discovering the cure for cancer, and we need to have imagination about all those issues. The problem is this, is that we have no curiosity about how we change ourselves. Universities are stuck in a bad model and, and our universities are never going to thrive fully unless they can change it. And that's where imagination comes in. Imagine, you know, look at this, look at this. I am a Luddite, okay? I, I, I to think of me using a, a Zoom, are you kidding? I mean, I would never do that. But here I am doing it right now. And, and so that means that I had to learn to use my imagination in a different way. And, and if I were to paint a vision of, of Ohio State or West Virginia University, I would have painted it about 10 years out that we'd start be doing all this technology stuff. Well, guess what happened? What, yeah. what, what we thought of was going to happen in 10 years happened in 10 weeks. And we have to keep ahead yep. and we have to make our people curious and we have to do that through our own imagination. So let me ask you a question, Gordon. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I love that what you just said. So can you teach curiosity and imagination or do you reveal it? And either way, how do we as leaders put in place the opportunities to either reveal or teach that? Because isn't that the end of the day, if, if I could sit, have one wish for our students graduating, it would be that they are, they know how to take initiative. They are curious. They want to learn and they want to keep learning and that they have imagination. Then they're world beaters. I, I you know, I think that, uh, I think it's the way that, we, let's talk about our faculty for a second. I think it's, I think it's the way that you structure the reward structure. I think the way you structure the university, you know, universities are structured the wrong way. They're, they're very vertical. They're structured in departments and colleges and into, in, into different kinds of uh, configurations. Remember when we were at Colorado together, you know, we had LAST, we had Jilla. They were structured around ideas. Yeah. And, and you can't have imagination without challenging the way that you're structured for, for that. The other thing is this, is you know, we talked about teaching, uh, research and public service. We ought to be talking about learning, discovery and, uh, and engagement and, and, and the language of the academy just drives me crazy. Teaching loads, how many times do I hear that? Teaching is the load, oh my God, I'm gonna have to go teach. Well, give me a break. It's, uh, it's, we've got to start thinking about the opportunities that we're doing. It, teaching, is, teaching is a responsibility. Academic freedom is a responsibility. Yeah. Academic, uh, all of these issues are responsibilities and we've got to start dealing with that as a reality. So how do we, and, and I, I hear what you're saying and, and I agree, we're at Colorado. I mean, examples of Jilla, for example, we've had what four Nobel laureates come out of Jilla in the, you know, in the last oh, 20 years. So there's something that they're doing right. And how do you, so I guess the way we do that is within the construct of the vertical, we have to have these cross-cutting initiatives and they have to be pretty comprehensive, mm -hmm. uh, but maybe not too big 
then they get unwieldy, but not too small because then they can't make the impact. Any any thoughts on that, Gordon? Yeah, I think that um, I think that uh, um, first of all, I think that uh, moving to the what I call the horizontal university is going to be critical, and that means you have to get rid of as, as many of the uh, of the Berlin walls and turn them into fences as much as you can. I mean, there has to be discipline and there has to be disciplines. Uh, you know, you can't have a lawyer teaching uh, physical therapy. It just doesn't work that way. But, um, but what you can do is you can start having, allowing and encouraging uh, uh, connectivity. I, I always use this point. If, if you're at Ohio State, one of the reasons you come there as a young faculty member is because it is the largest academic cafeteria in the country. You have everything there. And the reason you come is you want to eat at that cafeteria. And so you're a young philosopher and you want to spend some time with physicians and you started creating these programs. And then guess what happens? Some old white guy who's 65 years old in your philosophy department says, that's all well and good. You will not get tenure unless you do it my way. We have to we, first of all, we have to empower younger people. Secondly of all, we have to get rid of that kind of, that kind of, that kind of structural uh, response, which does not, not allow people to get outside of their, um, uh, of the reality. And that can only come from the president's office and from the provost. And I would say that we start organizing many more things in which they have a centralized role. Uh, and they report to the president or to the provost. That's the only way you're going to break the back. I, secondly, I would I would make certain that you, when you create institutes and working groups, that the, 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 their tenure lines are in those uh, in those uh, institutes and working groups rather than being in departments. That's the only way you're you, you, the only way you're going to change the culture of university is to break it and then change it. Other than that, I have no opinions, do I? You know, that's, that's one of the reasons I'm no longer at Ohio State. So there. <laughs> uh. President Johnson, I want to go back to something that you said a little earlier, um, because I think it's worth following up, especially because there are so many people who really want to get to know you and what your presidency is going to be all about. And, and uh, President Gee talked a bit about loving Ohio and loving the institution of the Ohio State University. Uh, you have family connections, and, and obviously you, you pointed them out. You have your grandfather's diploma. There's got to be some deeper meaning for you coming here, knowing that you have that family lineage. And then the, the second thing that I also would, would like to follow up with you on is the fact that you are a varsity athlete, and, and sports are a really important part of traditions here. And so I, I, th I think that people would like to know uh, how you come at sports uh, as well, if you don't mind. No, not at all. Maybe I'll start with the last one first because I visited the Moritz uh, College of Law yesterday. Marvelous visit. And one of the faculty members came up to me and said, so is it true, I read on Wikipedia that you founded the lacrosse program at Stanford. And I said, well, that is true, it was a long time ago. And she said, well, I played varsity lacrosse at Stanford and was able to go there on the scholarship, but for what you had done back then. And it was just awesome. And she's like one of the rock stars in the, in the College of Law. So that made my day. And then another faculty member came up as I think more vintage of, of um, Veronica and said, uh, yes, I understand Veronica. I looked up her records. She's a pretty amazing swimmer and this gal had been a swimmer too. So now you have two faculty members, both rock stars in the College of Law who learned from their experiences, uh, I think the same things that Veronica and I learned, which is you know, discipline, teamwork. Uh, teamwork's really important. You don't, I mean, to get things done in a complex system and to solve some of the great problems that face us, you need to be able to put together individuals that are experts in their field, but be able to develop a language where they can converge that expertise on solving the problem. And that's what you do when you play sports. You figure out a way, in the case I played field hockey and the cross, get the ball from one end to the other and into the goal, right? That's what we're going to see tomorrow, a lot of crossing the goal line. And that means sometimes, and this happened in my career, I'm on the bench and my biggest job is to get water to the kids on the, on the team playing. Sometimes I'm the kid on the, the team playing. And it's most important when I get past the ball to put it in the goal or to pass the ball to the person to put it in the goal. There are 
there are other ways to get that experience playing in an orchestra again. You know, you sort of, I played wing. So when the ball goes off the sideline, everybody stops, the whistles blow and it's obvious who messed up. You know, it's kind of similar in an orchestra. You play out of tune, people know. But as part, you know, at, at the Ohio State University with 1,200 athletes, so that's a significant percentage of our undergraduates that are getting that kind of experience, how to compete, but more than that, how to respect your opponent. And I think that goes back to something that Dr. V said. You know, we saw that with Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Justice Ginsburg and, and Justice Scalia. They didn't agree on, on everything. I don't know what they necessarily agreed on in terms of from the law and the interpretation of the law, but they loved each other. They were great friends. They respected each other's point of view. And I think that's the kind of thing that, that you learn when you're a great competitor, you know, you'll look at the kids tomorrow, no matter who wins, they'll greet each other, they'll say good game. And that's part of being, it's, it's easy to win. It's hard to lose and be graceful about it. So there's just so many things, so many lessons that, that, I've, that I learned through those experiences. So I couldn't be more happier to be at a university where you have 36 sports and 1,200 athletes, I think is part of the mission of the university. It's to pass on culture to the next generation and to educate our students and give them life skills to be successful. So that was an easy one. And now that I've talked all about that, I forget the first one. Would you mind <laughs> reminding me of the first part of the question? No, no, not at all. It's your family lineage. It's all right. So it's interesting. So my family uh, started out uh, in Virginia and there are two different migrations. One, uh, then some were Quakers and they didn't believe in slavery. So they came to Ohio. Other group um, migrated down to uh, North Carolina. And I mean, you know, the group that was on my uh, fraternal uh, lineage side. So my grandfather actually went here, went to Ohio. And you can go back five, six generations and see that one of the, uh, they have an original land grant in the early 1800s, I think even before the Ohio became a, a state. Uh, okay, now you know I'm not a history major, but it was, I've seen the land grants from Madison. So if that was before Ohio was a state, I'll have to look that up. Part of that culture. Mm -hmm. So I, I just, you know, I think that part of, we have our relatives that are buried here in the state of Ohio. And, you know, I plan to visit a lot, a lot of those grave sites. And uh, we have some second cousins that are in Cincinnati. And so, I'm, you know, I'm just, look, I do feel that it's home in a lot of ways. That, that's great. It's great to have that, uh, that history, too. I mean, and I love the fact you had that diploma there. And, and Christian, of course, was a Division I athlete. Uh, you look at me and you can tell that I was not an athlete at all. In fact, the, the, the only, the closest I've ever come to athletics is I get my ankles taped for a football game so <laughs> that I can, so that I can, I can wander around from box to box, as a matter of fact. So uh, that, that's a great story, Chris, uh, Christina, you know, um, and I know it was important when, when you and I talked about it, it was important that you did have a, a spiritual, a family connection with Ohio. I know that that you felt very strongly about that. And, uh, I think that's the reason you're going to you're going to have greatness there. You really are. It's uh, it's in your DNA, which is pretty damn good, right? <laughs> Gentlemen, anything else? Well, President Key, that's the, you get the other side of this now that you we've talked all through this. What what advice can you impart to President Johnson that we've not already talked about with regards to being at the helm of the Ohio State University? Oh, I, I know Christina very well. I, I, the only piece of advice I'll give her is just be her. You know, she's smart. She's able. She has done things. She's entrepreneurial. Uh, she has, um, you know, she's been part of uh, great institutions, but she's also been part of great programs. And she has started her own company and uh, been enormously successful. So the, th the, th the great thing about Christina is if someone can look at her and say, well, you don't know anything about that. And they say, well, I've already done it. I, I, you know, it's one of those kind of things is very, there are very few Renaissance people left in the world and she's one of them. So just be Christina. She'll be, she'll be great. She's got a great, she's got a great uh, partner, a great wife in, uh, in, in Veronica. And they're going to be a great family here for, um, for all of us, I think, in, in that, that love Ohio State. You know, thank you so much, Dr. D. And, and 
certainly uh, Veronica is just as excited to be here and uh, as I am. She grew up in Caracas, Venezuela, so uh, I'm not sure that through Ancestry.com there's a connection to Ohio, but we'll we'll uh, we'll look for that. But uh, we're, we're both <laughs> just thrilled and excited, and you know, I have to I have to share with you the reason I became an entrepreneur. Really, it's it's all Gordon's fault, and the reason why is that so when we were serving together at the University of Colorado, we we worked together on the largest grant the university had ever received up to that point. It was the National Science Foundation Engineering Research Center. And this is back in the 80s when large grants really weren't the thing. It was more individual investigators, one researcher and a few graduate students. And this is a big deal. It's five departments, two universities, and uh, 25 million over this period of time. And you were talking about this center. It was an optic center, uh, Gordon, and you said, and this this center is going to spin off, you know, a lot of jobs. I think you mentioned thousands of some kind, and my eyes got really big because now I'm the director of the center, and I thought, well, our president's just given us a mission. This is a mission we have to fulfill, and we had really had a few advances in the lab that looked pretty interesting, and we had we had uh, industrial relationships with 40 different companies. So to start spinning out ventures that could incubate the technology and then either create products, which many of us did, or commercialize and sell the company, which some of us did also, just seemed to be a no brainer. But that was the reason why, it's because our mission, which sounds funny now, but it was a big deal, uh, was to build new industries and a workforce for the 21st century. And we succeeded in that. But that's where I think also coming back to the land grant institution, I think the reason we both love them is because they have a very clear mission and it's a service mission and it's to serve the communities you live in and, and as you've said in your book influence those you serve and there's nothing like having that kind of calling that kind of mission and that is our north star absolutely absolutely mm -hmm. so and uh and you know and and i think that that's the reason that uh the, the you just have to love these kinds of institutions is that um they do. They, they do have something which is in their DNA, which is about uh, about being called to make a difference for every person they touch. The goal of Christina is to is, is is to have every Ohioan in their hearts and minds believe that Ohio State's the most important thing in their lives, and uh, and that is very doable. I can tell you. So well, you anyway. That's Thanks. a wrap. Thank you very much. <laughs> this was you. fun. It was fun. Perfect. Very yeah. fun.